oh, what? I was going to hit you with the, there is a great quote I love about the, uh, in Star Wars, it's the ship that made the Kessel run in less than 12 parsecs. And it's like used as a term of like relating to speed when it's only meant is distance, right? Because the parsec is just distance. Correct. Yeah, that was one of the errors that they tried to fix in Solo. Yeah. Um, because yes, a parsec is a unit of distance. And um, in the original movie, it was definitely implied that he meant a unit of time. Um, yeah. But then if you watch Solo, you know, there's like the main path through, you know, the Kessel system. But uh, Han made a shortcut through the dangerous area. And so that's why he was able to do it in, you know, fewer parsecs. Exactly. So... Well, you know, I, I will say this happens a lot in movies where they misuse things all the time. So, yeah, it's kind of fun actually if you're a sciencey <laughs> kind of person watching these things exactly. and uh, catching their errors. So. Huh. Anyway, all right. Well, hey, let's keep talking fluids because last time we got to the point where we had talked about pressure. And how we saw that pressure changed with depth and density. And we also looked at Archimedes principle. We now have buoyancy, which is something we're going to take into account. Um, in fact, the lab, not this week, because we're going to have exam this week, but lab next week. Um, I think I can actually get this set up so that you guys can um, figure out the density of unknown masses by floating them in water and, and weighing them. So that's at least gonna be our uh, attempt, uh, attempted lab next week. But anyway, so we got there. We've now talked about um, that, but now um, we need to talk about fluid dynamics. What happens when fluid moves? Because pressure and buoyancy have nothing to do with movement, right? All of that was just, we've got a fluid. So um, we actually call that fluid statics because things are stationary. But fluid mechanics, um, that's going to be now, or fluid dynamics, that's going to be what happens as um, fluids move. So let me go to the board and start with some definitions. All right. So. When it comes to flow, fluids flow in different ways. And there are two main types that we need to talk about. So we have what we call laminar flow and turbulent flow. So I bet you can imagine what turbulent flow is. Just by the name, what do you think we mean by turbulent flow? Like rough or disorganized? Yeah, that's exactly it. When you have turbulent flow, you have things, uh, I'm just going to draw you like arrows of current. So maybe we've got some current going like that and another one like this and just kind of random. Right, this would be turbulent flow because it's just kind of going haphazardly all over the place. Laminar flow, on the other hand, is where everything is flowing nice and smoothly. Okay, so this would be laminar. And then the first one was turbulent. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, laminar flow this is the one that we actually study a lot because it's easy. And um, a lot of things actually do flow turbulently or laminarly. laminarly. Oof, it's a tough one to say. Um, <clears throat> but when we have laminar flow, it's really easy to describe mathematically. So we're really going to be looking at this case, the laminar versus the turbulent 
Um, really good examples of both. Think about like if you've ever seen smoke coming off of like a candle that you just blew out. I don't know if you've ever noticed, um, but you blow out your candle and you get smoke that comes wisping up. And at first, that smoke follows kind of nice little lines. But as they go further up, then they just start going all kinds of wonky. And so what you'll see in that smoke is that it starts flowing in a laminar way, in a laminar manner, and then turns to turbulent. I want you to notice that the next time you blow out a candle or if you're a cigarette smoker, look at the smoke coming off of the cigarette. Um, but you'll see that it starts laminar and then turns to turbulent. So usually, even on a small scale, you can take flows and look at them in a laminar manner and then use that as your approximation. It's obviously just a short-term approximation mm -hmm. because eventually it's going to turn um, turbulent, chaotic, but we'll use laminar at the start. Okay, so we good with the difference, laminar versus turbulent? And like your example, they can, fluids can be both. Oh yes. Yeah, and in fact, the same flow can turn from one to another. Absolutely. Other questions? Okay, so let's look at laminar flow. Now, when a fluid is flowing, the mass of the fluid doesn't change, right? It's not like if we've got water, water is water. Its mass is whatever it is. It's not actually gaining any kind of mass. Um, obviously, we could have stuff dissolving in, like if we're going to talk about salt water, but let's not talk about that. We're talking about just we've got a um, the fluid itself. Okay, so the mass doesn't change. So this is sort of a conservation principle. Whatever mass we start with is what we end with. So I want to draw just a little picture here. And imagine that we've got a tube of fluid. Okay, now it may not actually be a tube. Like there may not be anything physically that's defining this. It could be, right? It could be like a hose or a funnel or something like that. But we can also think of this as a tube of fluid if we think about what we call streamlines. Imagine that we've got a particle in our fluid that's right here and it's going to start flowing. It's going to follow a path that we call its streamline. Okay, so every particle follows a streamline, which is just showing you how it's moving in the flow. So, what we could do is basically take a collection of particles and basically form all of their streamlines. So here's another one that does this. And then maybe put a third one off the side. That does maybe something like that. Right, but we do this for all of the points in some little region here. And you can see how, I'll make this dash, that's kind of helpful for me. Those streamlines themselves kind of form the tube. Okay, so we call this a flow tube, and it's made of the streamlines. So <clears throat> what we know because of the fact that mass is conserved, basically, is that whatever mass we've got at the beginning has to be the same mass at the end. And so what this gets us is it's going to allow us to build what we call the continuity equation. And it looks a little bit like this.
Well, let's build it. Let's think about the water that's flowing through here. Okay, so if we go with Q as an amount of water, or amount of fluid, I should say, and I apologize, I'm probably going to say water a lot just because that's what I'm used to fluids being, but this applies to any fluid. Okay, so Q, this is going to be the amount of fluid flowing. Okay, so a way to think about it is it's a flow rate. So that means that Q is defined as dV dt, where V is our volume, and then T is time. So we're looking at the change in volume over time at any one spot. So that would be your flow rate. So imagine that you're out at, you know, one of the creeks like Taylor Creek or Trout Creek or something like that and you were to basically do a cross section of the creek. So, you know, something like this. So our creek is down here. If you were to basically just sit there and watch how much water came by as it flowed down, that's what this is measuring. Okay, so a large Q means that a lot of fluid is coming by quickly. A small Q is that it's flowing very slowly. Okay, well, let's think about how you would find that volume. We know that we get volume by doing area times thickness. Remember from your calculus when you did volume by slicing. So we can think of this dv dt instead as a d, let's call it a times x dt. So a is going to be your cross-sectional area, and then x is just a distance. So like if you were to look at this flow tube, really think about this end, the end is this area is the surface area of the, of the circular elliptical piece, and then x would be just a little tiny thickness so that we get a slice. Well, if we rewrite this, this is equal to, well, let's just think about it this way. So um, we know that we want this change to equal zero. So if we kind of break this apart, let's just go with that the area of any slice is fixed. This is the same as a times dx dt, which is a times velocity. So this is what's going to give us our continuity equation. Whatever volume was coming in to that tube has to be the same volume leaving in the same amount of time. And so what that ends up giving us is an equation that looks like this. A1V1 equals A2, V2. Because this is basically the flow rate at one equaling the flow rate at two. All right, so put a box around this. Because this is our continuity equation. But it's very important. This is only true for fluids that are incompressible. So do you remember what compressible meant? You could change the volume of the occupied space by, uh, sorry, but compressing it. Yeah, yeah, the volume of the space can change. The volume of the space that's taken up by a certain amount of fluid can change by applying pressure or whatever, right? So like air is compressible, but water is not. So this is true only for the incompressible flows. Now, 
Uh, so Victor, Q should be a vector. Actually, no, Q is not a vector because this V, this isn't the vector V, it's the speed. So I have a question for you. Sure. I was just thinking about um, compressible stuff. Um, ice is not considered a fluid, correct? Correct. Um, so, but you can compress snow, and by doing that, you can ch change the phase of it. Um, I don't know where I'm going with this, but... Does, does that make sense? You can compress ice and change change the phase into water. Okay. Pressure, temperature changes phase. Yep. So, in one state, things can't be compressed, but in others, they can, and that's pretty common, correct? So, um... again, I know ice isn't a fluid. I'm just I don't know. I'm just going off on a kind of chemistry physics tangent in my mind. Yeah. So let, let me see what I can do about this. Um, when you compress snow by applying that force, that pressure force, you're making the molecules interact more, right? And it's causing them to heat up, which then causes it to change um, state. Right? You're changing the state by basically adding energy through pressure. A little bit of heat from your hands, but um, it's more the, the pressure that's doing that. Um, so are you actually compressing it? Are you making it have smaller volume to a point? Right, There is a point where you're getting all the air out of the way. Um, but then I think when it starts turning into liquid, you're not actually compressing it anymore. I don't know that the volume is really changing. And in fact, the volume at some point starts to expand because water is, wait a minute, no, yeah. Because here's the weird thing about water is that it's not densest at zero degrees. It's actually densest at like four degrees. So it's, it's really weird. Water just has weird properties. So um, the changing of the temperature, while it may cause a little bit of compression, technically, you know, I don't know. Um, but we don't usually talk about non-fluids as being compressible. Because really what happens is um, like if you say, well, we can take, say, a bunch of sand, but fuse it together into glass, you're, you're changing the material. And by changing it, we, we no longer call that compressing. You're going through a chemical change. So is that, yeah. I don't know if that can yeah. answer it. No, that helps. Okay. Because, like, you can... Com Again, like you said, you don't call it compressing. You can like add pressure to the snow, but at a certain point, you're not actually doing anything else to the water. You're just adding energy to the system. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so then Victor just typed in something. He said if the fluid um, is like oil or something that sticks to the wall, how is it possible to conserve V? Okay, so a couple things. When I draw that picture, I'm not necessarily saying there is a wall. That tube is really just being formed by the fluid itself. Okay, so you could actually have a tube like that in the middle of the ocean. If you were just to look at the particles, specific particles and their um, streamlines, and you were to put all those streamlines together. You actually have a very good question about what happens when we do have like a wall. And in that case, it's friction. I mean, you have friction and um, it tends to make it so that you get drag. The drag goes away the further you are from the wall. So like imagine you have a pipe around 
the round pipe. When you're near the center, there's virtually no drag, but out at the edge, there's a lot. And so what you'll get if you look at a velocity versus radius graph, you'll see that it slows down a lot the bigger you are, the, the further out, the closer you are to the edge. Um, but when I wrote this equation, I'm not saying that V is conserved, the velocity or the speed is conserved. I'm saying the volume. So big V is volume and the volume is definitely conserved because even if we're like in that situation where we have stuff kind of sticking on the side, imagine that that's completely full, completely full of your oil or honey or whatever else that's really thick. I still am going to have whatever I send in is going to push out an equivalent amount from the other side because there's nowhere else for it to go when it's incompressible. If it's compressible, we might not have as much come out as went in, right? Because we can, by putting pressure here, we might be compacting it somewhere later and it doesn't come out as much. Um, but in the case of incompressible, it has to be whatever I'm pushing in is coming out on the other side. Okay, and so then your last question, can a fluid have something like rotational motion? Absolutely. Um, we see that all the time. That's what um, like hurricanes have that happen, tornadoes. So if we're talking about air, rotational motion, even bigger scale, there's, you know, uh, general circulation patterns that are um, cyclonic. And then um, in terms of liquids, we see that in the ocean as well, right? We can get... Um, we call them gyres, G-Y-R-E. Um, you can get gyres in the ocean that are rotational. Um, if you look at general surface rotation or uh, flow patterns in the ocean, there's definitely circularness rotation to it. We also call them eddies, if you've ever heard that word. Um, you can also see this coming off of like wings of aircraft. Sometimes you'll see like the smoke or uh, water vapor and it kind of spirals like this as it comes off the edges of the wings. Um, but you can definitely have rotational motion. And even inside of one of these tubes, you can have that. But if it's rotational, it's not laminar. We don't call that laminar flow anymore. So um, we're gonna be kind of assuming laminar flow for a while but you can definitely have rotational motion as well. Okay, so Ralph then just said, is there an equation for the incompressible and compressible at the same time? Can they happen at the same time? Um, yes and no. I will show you what the equation looks like for those that are compressible, because it's very similar, but we have to add in a density thing because we can change the density. Right, like if I have a compressible, I can get all that material into a smaller volume, but I have to do that by increasing density. So there is a second form and that second form actually becomes the first form. It becomes the um, incompressible form. So uh, there is a second, but it's really not a second. And that general one we can use all the time. So I'll, I'll put that on the board here real quick. Any other questions? Yeah, I have one more. Sure. Is plasma fluid? Um, <sighs> I don't know, actually. I don't know if it's classified as a fluid or not. Um, I don't know enough about the properties of plasmids to say one way or the other. I'm going to guess yes, but I don't know for sure. Okay. So. Okay, well, let me go back to the board and I'll show you the form for the compressible and how it ends up being the same. 
Okay, so if we go to compressible, right, this is the incompressible. For the compressible, what we need to do is throw in a density onto either side. So the row one is going to be the density at point one, where we're doing where we're doing the first slice. And then row two is the density on the other side. Because now if we think about that flow, it's not just, uh, well, if we think about the mass, the density matters. So it's a mass per volume times volume. And so this is what it is if it's compressible. Now, if you think about the difference between these two, a non-compressible or an incompressible flow has the same densities. The density doesn't change because we can't pack it in. And so since the density can't change, row one and row two are equal. So you can divide them out. And that just brings you to this first one. So the more generic is this guy, the one I've got in blue for compressible flow. But if it's non-compressible, you know, just set your densities to equal. Okay, so you've seen this. You've seen this in action. Because think about what this tells you. It tells you the product of area and velocity, area and speed, have to be the same. So if we increase the area, we have to decrease the velocity, or vice versa. Decreasing the area increases the velocity. And a great example of where you've seen that is if you've ever played with water coming out of a hose. So think about when you've got water coming out of a hose and you put your thumb over the end. If you don't cap it all the way, if you still leave a little bit of a gap, what happens? It shoots out farther. Yeah, that water shoots out way farther. Right? That's how you get your brother wet in a water fight or whatever. Or you want to spray the part of your garden that's further away. You just kind of close the end a little bit and let it go. And that's this continuity equation. By covering up, you're decreasing the area. Decreasing the area causes a proportional change in velocity. So you get an increase in velocity, which means the water flows out faster, which then, like Bradley said, means it goes further. As we've seen from kinematics, that a greater initial velocity means a greater distance traveled horizontal. OK, so you've seen that. You've seen this happen. Um, and it's a real thing. Um, you also notice this. Again, I'm going to go to like Trout Creek or Taylor Creek. Next time you have a chance, go out wandering one of the meadows and go check out one of the creeks. And what I want you to look at is how fast the water is flowing. And I want you to compare a wide part to a narrow part. Because you know how these creeks, you know, sometimes they're wide and they get narrow and all that. But you will definitely see a difference in the flow, that in a wide area, it goes much slower than in a narrow area. Or if you've ever been somewhere where you see a waterfall, you see that happen too, <laughs> right? Like, as it's coming into the rapids, it speeds up. Where further back, it's not moving as quickly because it's wider. Um, you'll notice this, like if you're driving down 50 to Sac, you know how you parallel the American River. Um, you can definitely see that at the wide spots, it's moving much slower than at the narrow spots. All right, so now we've got compressibility. So the compressibility, it definitely affects this continuity, which will change velocity. Um, and if it's incompressible, then you know that the product of area and velocity has to be the same, no matter where we are. 
in the flow. So if you were to slice through that flow anywhere, whatever that new area would be, would give you a similar uh, change in your velocity. Okay, so there's your next thing about fluids, but this is just a real basic, has to happen as we're flowing. But the next one I wanna give you is kind of the biggie. This is the big one for um, flows, and it's what's called Bernoulli's equation. So you've probably heard that name. The Bernoullis were a family. There are a whole bunch of these guys that were um, not just the physics guy, but there were mathematicians as well. And um, it was a, well, the main ones were a dad and two brothers. But this one, has to do with flow, Bernoulli's equation. Um, Bernoulli, the mathematician Bernoulli did a lot with um, probability. So you see his name in probability and statistics. Um, but anyway, so this is Bernoulli's equation. So what Bernoulli's equation is, is all about looking at what happens to the flow as we go from one point to another in one of these flow tubes. So what we're going to do, let me see if I can draw this semi-decently, but we're going to have a flow that changes not only area, but we're also going to change elevation. Okay, so this is literally going up. So this is a flow that's moving upward. So I'm going to have my flow going this direction. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at a chunk of water. Fluid, sorry. We're going to look at a chunk of the fluid that's down here. Okay, so think of that as just one of those little cylindrical slices, kind of like what you did when you did volumes by slicing and calculus not that long ago. So let's say that this has got an area of A1. It's flowing at a speed of V1. And there's a certain pressure that's pushing on it down here at the bottom. And let's say that that pressure is P1. And then the last thing I need to give you is like a thickness. And let's just say that this has a thickness of delta S or DS. So we'll call that DS1 for its thickness. Okay, so that's what this thing looks like for right here. So if we were to look at the volume, the little differential volume, call it dV, the big V, the differential volume here is going to be A1 times dS1. And if we want to look at the pressure force, it's going to be P1 times A1. It's pressure times area. All right, so that's pretty much everything we need to know about that, with the exception of we should probably have some sort of axes here so that we can say that the center of mass of this let's say is at y1. 
because obviously as we move this up, we're gonna have changes that are due to the flow of the fluid, but also the elevation change, right? If we're gonna talk about say potential energy, we know the gravitational potential energy changes because it now moves higher. All right, so, so far so good. So let's think about that same chunk as it moves further up. What's going to have to happen to it as it moves further up? Pressure and B are going to have to increase. Okay, so there should definitely be a change in pressure and V. Right, and V for sure is going to have to increase because the area is getting smaller. Right, because now if we look at the cross sectional area, let's say we're right here, it's going to be a little circle. So we know from continuity that the speed is going to have to increase. It's also going to get thicker. Why does it have to get thicker? A is decreasing, therefore the molecules are going to be more packedly tight. So it's, it's actually not going to be more packed. It's just, it's incompressible. So whatever volume we have here has to be the same volume once it gets further up. So Victor, you put, because Q1 equals Q2, and that's kind of right. It's going to be because of that and the fact that it's incompressible. OK, so we have to have a new thickness. So let's call this DS2. It's going to have a new cross-sectional area. So let's call that cross-section a2. <clears throat> it's also going to have a new velocity, v2. There's going to be a pressure pushing on it. But now let's think about pushing on it from this side. And that's going to be, say, p2. And its center of mass is also at a new y. There's going to be a y2 somewhere over here. All right, so let's start by looking at work. Okay, so let's look at this thing in terms of work done as it moves from here to there. So we know what the forces are. Oh, let me actually, let me rewrite down here the same things for the second block. We know that it's dV is going to be A2 times dS2. <clears throat> and it's pressure force is going to be P2, A2. All right, so let's look at, let, let's break this down into a bunch of different pieces. So the first is going to be, what is the work being done by the surrounding fluid? Right, because there's the stuff outside this tube that's applying force. Got those pressure forces. So if we want to look at what the work difference is, we have to look at basically the work on or the force on either side. And then we need to basically subtract them, right? Because the net work is going to be one minus the other. So that's what this is going to be first. This is going to be the work done by the surrounding fluid.
Okay, so we're going to have to take the pressure times area and then that same force is going to go through the entirety of the slice. Everything in there is going to feel that same force. Hopefully you remember that when we were talking about pressure. If you apply pressure at one point, it's felt throughout. So in this little chunk, it's felt throughout. So we're going to get P1 times A1 times that DS1, because it's the same pressure as we move through this entire thing. And we're going to subtract from that P2, A2, DS2. So we're subtracting because P2 is pointing in the opposite direction, right? The external fluid is pushing the other way. But again, it's multiplying by A2 and it goes through that entire thickness. Now, remember that A1 times DS1 and A2 times DS2, those are DVs. So if we kind of put that all together, this becomes P1 DV minus P2 DV, which is P1 minus P2 times DV. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to put a little box around that. I'm going to try to remember not to erase it. Because this is some of the work done as we move this particle. Okay, now if we think about the rest of the work done, the rest of the work done is going to be done by gravity. And so since gravity is a conservative force, uh, real quick, so Victor says DS or DV. This is a D big V. This is differential volume, not differential velocity. So again, since gravity is conservative, conservative feel, uh, uh, force, what that means is that we can actually break the rest of this down into kinetic and potential energies. So let's look at this. Let's look at the initial, what's its kinetic energy and potential energy, and then look at what we get when we're up top and recognize that the change in those is going to be due to this work, the work due to the fluid. All right, so let's do kinetic energy first. So for kinetic energy, we know that kinetic energy is equal to one half mv squared. So the change in the kinetic energy, I'll write it as dk, is going to be the difference in these two. So let's think about how we get mass. Mass is density times volume. So we're going to get one half our density times our volume. Well, the volume is dv. And then the velocities, well, it's going to be V2 squared minus V1 squared. And so let me put a box around that. Because that's going to be the change in our kinetic energy. The one half mass, it's the same for either chunk. It's just the velocities are changing because of where we are. Okay, so now let's go to potential energy. 
So for the potential energy, if we assume that we're going very small distance vertically, we can use just good old MGH. So this wouldn't necessarily be applicable if we had this, let's say it was an atmospheric flow tube and we were going up, you know, many, many kilometers. But for the most part, this is going to be fine. So that's just good old MGH, which means if we look at the DU, the change, well, the masses again are the same. That's just the rho times dv. G is going to be the same wherever we are. And so then the h's, well, those two heights were y2 and y1, respectively. OK, so I'm going to put a box around that. So the potential in kinetic should be no big deal. You're used to that. This one's a little bit weird because we're looking at the work done by the fluid, which is really the pressures coming from the other side. That's why we have this difference. But now let's put this all together. So what we know is that the change in energy will work. Yeah? Hopefully you remember that from the work energy theorem from last quarter. So that means we can kind of string these three together and it's going to look like this. That work, P1 minus P2 times dV, that's going to equal the change in the kinetic or the sum of the change in the kinetic and the change in the potential. So we'll have P1, let me write this one, it's work, change in work, so the work done, equal to the change in energy. So we have P1 minus P2 times dV is equal to rho G dV times Y2 minus Y1 plus one half rho dv times v2 squared minus v1 squared. So I'm just putting these two, the potential and kinetic together, setting them equal to work. So notice that the dvs are going to go away. Every term has a dV. So the size of that little chunk, that little slice, was irrelevant. It didn't actually matter. The other thing I'm going to do is I'm going to move all of the y1, p1, all the ones together on one side, and all the twos together on the other side. So I'm going to get P1 plus rho G Y1 plus one half rho V1 squared. That was all the ones are the ones I brought over to the left. And then on the right, I'm going to get P2 plus rho G Y2 plus one half rho v2 squared. And this is kind of interesting because if you look at both sides, both sides there have the same form. Right? We've got a p1, there's a p2. Rho g y1, rho g y2. One half rho v1 squared, one half rho v2 squared. And since those were two places in our flow, and I didn't spe uh, specify exactly where they were, what this tells us, we can kind of 
condense this into one thing. That says that if you take the pressure and you add rho g y, and then you add one half rho v1 squared, that that's going to be constant. So in essence, this is a conservation law. It's just what we're conserving is this weird combination of pressures, densities, and positions, and speeds. Well, go ahead and put your box around this because this is Bernoulli's equation. What does this constant represent again? Um, <laughs> nothing in particular. Okay. It's just going to be the number that we get for a specific flow. But remember that this has to be incompressible. It has to be steady. And, you know, so laminar. And we can't have any other kind of like drag or anything like that. If we get back to, I think it was Victor who asked that about, you know, something thick like oil. If we actually have, say, a tube and stuff flowing through, uh, Bernoulli is going to fail us a bit. Do you see why? Like, what's friction going to do here? It's going to cause us to lose energy. Yeah, it would come about in the work. When we did that work calculation, there would also be work being done by the friction, which would then change how things fall out. OK, so how about we talk about what this means? Because it's great. I mean, we did a nice little derivation. Got some lovely information here, but who the hell cares? Okay, well, what this tells you is that there's a dance between the three main qualities of the fluid. It matters what kind of pressure we've got. If pressure changes, so if we change the pressure on either end of this fluid, there has to be a corresponding change in either elevation or velocity. We're going to assume the density is the same. That's incompressible. We're going to assume gravity is the same, which we made that assumption already that we're on a very short vertical distance. So the only things that change here are P, Y, and V. So you change the pressure, you have to change either the elevation or the velocity. Similarly, if you change the elevation, you're going to change either the pressure or the velocity. Also, if you change the velocity, then you have to change either the pressure or the altitude, the elevation. Okay, so these three things are all in a dance together. As one of them adjusts, or as one changes, the other two have to adjust accordingly in order for it to stay constant. Okay, so. Again, so what? Who cares? What does this do? Well, this is how lots of things in the real world work. Have you look at me set so I can use my hands. All right, so for example, airplanes. This is why airplanes can fly. So I don't know if you've ever thought about it, about what makes an airplane fly. 
But what we need is some sort of force that'll push up, right? Because on its own accord, an airplane is gonna fall to the ground because of gravity. So in order for it to stay up, there has to be a force greater than or equal to gravity to keep it in the air. So the word we use for that is lift. So you've probably heard that term when it comes to airplanes, but we need to have lift. Well, it's Bernoulli's equation. That's what causes that lift. So here's what goes on with an airplane. So we've got an airplane wing, right? There's the wing of the airplane. And the air, let's say that the airplane's flying this direction. So the air is gonna flow over the top and also flow under the bottom. Now, the way the wings are de designed is so that you change the velocity. You have different speeds in the two different positions. You already have different Ys, right? Like when you come back to this derivation, look at that derivation. You got Y1 and Y2, bottom of the plane, top of the plane, okay? So we've already increased Y but we also design it so that the velocity is greater on top. So these things are designed so that what they basically do is that if you think without, an, without a wing, the air would be coming by you in lines that look like this. It'd be nice and laminar. Okay, so then as the wing comes here, these things get pushed the ones that are far away stay pretty much straight because they're not getting affected. The ones right by the wing get pushed up. So now we've got those in a much smaller space than originally, right? Originally they were spread out. They hit that wing and they come together. So what we just did was we decreased A. We decreased the cross-sectional area and we know from flows that that's going to cause an increase in velocity. The other option would be to have it compress and change the density, but you can imagine that the air is not going to really compress as the wing flies through because it doesn't have a lot of time to compress. There is going to be some compression at the front, right? You can think about the air that's coming right at the tip of the wing, it's going to get pushed together and will compress, but most of it is going to fly right over the top. So we go from big A to small a, which means greater velocity. So think about on top, we have bigger V and bigger Y. Okay, so go back to Bernoulli's formula. I don't know if you guys can see it. Let me... just in case you're only looking at me in the big screen. So if we look at this, notice we just increased V and we increased Y. In order for this to remain constant, what has to happen to our pressure? Does it go up or down? Yeah, so Victor just typed in increase it's gonna to have to go up. Or, uh, sorry, no, it's not gonna have to go, it's gonna to have to go down. <laughs> Since velocity and Y increase, those numbers got bigger, this thing has to drop to balance it out. So it turns out that the pressure on top is now lower. Okay, we'll come back and look at me again. So here's our, our wing. We now have lower pressure on top, higher pressure on the bottom. So that means in terms of forces, there's a greater force on the bottom than on the top. Well, we already know that if you have unbalanced forces, it's gonna go in the direction of the bigger force. So that bigger force starts pushing it upward and creates lift. So it's all about the design of the wing so that you can get a um, significant enough increase in velocity to allow for a 
significant enough drop in pressure, which then causes our plane to go up. Okay, so uh, Victor just said, so the reason for an engine to be working in the air while in the air has nothing to do with gravity. Uh, no, not really. What it's doing is it's just keeping the speed of the plane up enough. Because like, you have to have that air flowing over the wing, right? There has to be a certain amount of velocity at the start so that you get a change enough. And in order for that differential to happen, the air has to be flowing over, which means the plane has to be going forward. So what the engines are doing is they're actually keeping the plane propelling forward so that relative to the wing, the air is coming over the wing, which creates the lift. That's also why airplanes have to get to a certain speed before they take off. Right. Think about when you've been in an airplane. Um, I don't know if anyone's not been, but um, hopefully everybody's been in and, and kind of remembers. But when you take off, they crank it, man. They get it going super fast because you have to get those velocities going enough. You have to get the flow over the wing enough to cause that pressure differential. So that's why they have to keep going. Um, Propeller planes, right, the ones that actually have propellers, which are rare these days, um, but a propeller plane, it's also using, you can think of that propeller as kind of like a wing itself, and it's using that to help propel it forward by creating a pressure differential as it spins through. Um, it's kind of, it's grabbing the air, basically, and pulling against the air. Kind of works the same way that a... Um, that a, a propeller on a ship, on a, on a boat or a submarine works. It's the same kind of thing as it spins. It's basically grabbing the fluid, the water, acting like a screw and moving itself forward. Okay, so Victor says, so that's a good way to save energy, right? Because while in the air, we don't care so much about the weight of the plane, just air resistances. Um, no, we still do care about the weight. Right? We still have to counteract the weight, the gravitational force, which requires at least that minimum difference in pressures on top and bottom of the wing. And that only comes from getting the right change in velocities. So there is a minimum speed at which we have to fly. And that depends on the plane and how loaded it is but there is a minimum speed that that plane has to have or else it will fall. Um, pilots call that stalling. If you've ever heard that term, the plane will stall. Um, so th there is a minimum speed that you have to attain. Beyond that, the greater speed will let you go up. But once you reach your altitude where you wanna be, you can definitely cut back on the engines. And the next time you're in a plane, think about it, you'll feel it, right? They, they've got us going, we're climbing, 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 and then they reach altitude and you can even hear it. You'll hear them dial back on the engines because they don't need to go as fast anymore because they just have to equal gravity, right? If we're flying at a level altitude, we just have to equal gravity. If we wanna go up, we got to have more than gravity, which means you got to go faster. And then the same thing when they want to drop. You, you'll notice when you're coming for landing. So you're flying up here and you'll hear it. You'll hear the engines cut back and it starts to drop because now we're going slower and there's less lift. Of course, as you start falling, you start increasing the speed which then will create lift, right? So it is a balance. And, and I know that uh, one of my cousins is a pilot. And of course, we've talked about this because I'm a nerd. And of course, I want to hear all about it. Um, but he says that when you're landing, you definitely have to keep pulling up, right? Because otherwise, you're going to speed up and then it's, it's, you know, it all messes with you. So you definitely have to adjust your... Um, 
Those aren't rudders. These are rudders. Flaps. No, ailerons. Ailerons, I think, are these things. Um, but you have to adjust those as you land to deal with the change in speed. Anyway, so there's a ton, a ton of physics that goes into um, airplanes. Okay, so, they, so there is a speed limit too. If you go too fast, there could be too much pressure. Um, yeah, if you go too fast, you could uh, definitely run into problems. Um, and that's going to be more the uh, shear force, seeing we've talked about shear force. Um, it's going to be the shear force on the materials. Now we've got a force that's coming across the surface that's too strong, um, that wants to break it apart. Um, and it would also cause you to want to try to go up when you don't want to go up. You don't need any more lift. So there probably is a specified speed window for each kind of plane. But that, that I don't know for sure. Um, I'll, I'll send my cousin a, uh, I'll send him a text, see what he says. Um, he can at least tell you, he was, he was a naval pilot, so he can tell you about fighters, um, what they needed. Um, it won't translate to like a 737 or something like that, but um, I'll ask him. I'll see what he says about that, Victor. All right, any other questions about airplanes? Okay, cool. Well, let's take a break. I think it's a good place to stop. Um, I need to go get a drink of water here real quick. But when we come back, we'll talk a little bit more about fluids, all right? So I'm going to go ahead and pause the recording. All right, so uh, again, the airplane's a great example of Bernoulli and, and where that comes about. But there are lots of places where this matters. Um, do you remember when I had those tubes that were full of fluid and we saw how all the heights were the same, but then I blew over the top of one with the straw and you remember what happened? What happened to that one that I blew over with the straw? So Max just typed, it went up and it did. We saw that its level went up and the others went down. So why was that? Well, that was Bernoulli. So uh, I'm going to show you something using the whiteboard. So I'm going to share my screen, but we're going to use the whiteboard. I just got a new toy. Um, I, I got a little like art pad drawer thing. So we're going to see how this goes. Um, but let's see if I can make this work. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. We'll go to a whiteboard. This will make it so that I don't have to bounce back and forth between images as much. Okay, so let me kind of draw what we saw when we were there before. So everybody should be able to see the, the whiteboard, but we had kind of one of these and then we had another one. I'm just going to draw three of them. Okay, but they were all connected. So we had some sort of a fluid level, right? So let me put our fluid levels. Right, but they were all at the same height. Now, think about what happened. I took a straw and I started blowing over the top of one of these. So let's just say that it was this one. So we had air that was flowing across like this. But what I did was I made it go really fast. So think about Bernoulli. In terms of elevations, the elevations are all the same for all these air columns. The velocity though, if the velocity goes up, then what we need is a decrease 
in pressure. So at that point, we saw that the pressure went down. Okay, so lower pressure, what that's gonna do is that's gonna cause the water level to go up because there's less air pushing down. Okay, well, if that water level goes up, it's gotta come from somewhere else. So these other ones dropped a little bit. So we saw those go down. We saw this one go up. So there's another example of where we've seen this. And that's why I was able to make that do what I wanted it to do. Now, I already knew that, of course, but I was making use of Bernoulli. So I'm curious. I'm actually going to stop share for a second. I'm curious if you've ever noticed this. Have you ever been... Um, like when it's been a windy day, windy day outside, and um, you're in the bathroom and you see the water in the toilet bowl. Have you ever noticed what happens on a windy day? And I know it's kind of random looking at toilet water on a windy day. But I want you to do this the next time it's windy, next time it's, it's a, a windy day outside, go into the bathroom and just look at what's going on with the water level in the toilet. Because you will see it going up and down with the wind. So yeah, <laughs> see this is assuming it goes up too. Yeah, because think about what's going on. It's, it's not that the air in your house is, um, necessarily changing but it can it can be changing the pressure inside your house a bit um, but there is now a differential in pressure between the two surfaces and you'll see it go up and down so that's another place you'll see it or how about this have you ever been driving on the highway and been passed by a truck or have passed a truck itself have you ever noticed that you get pulled towards the truck a little bit. This is another one. If you don't remember this, pay attention the next time. So like if you're driving to Reno and you're on, you know, Washoe Valley where you can go like 75 or something like that. Um, notice what happens when you pass a truck. Because what will happen as you're passing the truck is you'll feel yourself get kind of sucked in a little bit towards the truck. And then you get past the truck and then you, you feel yourself come back out. Okay. Now, this again is Bernoulli. Think of the air between the truck and the car as your flow. Okay. So as you're coming up to that truck, all that air is nice and big, no big deal. But then once you come up here, you're now getting that air into a small little area which is causing it to go fast. If you were to stand in between a car and truck as they're passing each other, you'd feel crazy wind. Like it, it, it'd be flowing by real quickly. Well, higher velocity means lower pressure. So the pressure in between is less than over here. Well, greater pressure on the side pushes you in. And then once you get past, now the pressures have equalized and so you come back out. So that's another place where you can actually experience it in everyday life. All right, so lots of places, um, firefighters have to worry about this because of the pressure differential in the, like the water hoses are going up into a building. Um, if you're gonna design a structure you'll uh, have to be concerned with water flow up higher, like a skyscraper. They have to have all kinds of pumps to get the water to have any kind of pressure up high. Um, when we get back to campus, whenever that is, um, check out the water flow on the water fountains upstairs 
versus the water fountains downstairs. You'll see that there's a drastic difference. This time it's the Y that changed. You've gone up in elevation, so there has to be a decrease in either velocity or pressure or both. And you'll see that in the water flow. So um, all kinds of examples of all this stuff out there in the real world. Um, it just reminded me of one I forgot to tell you um, la when we were talking about the continuity, area times velocity. And this is one that's really easy to see. Turn on your faucet so you're getting a nice solid stream. You don't want it super high so that it's going, you know, crazy out, but just a nice solid stream. And what you'll see is that it gets narrower as you drop down. It's wider up top and narrower on the bottom. So we went from a bigger area to a smaller area. Okay, so why is that happening? Can you tell me why that's happening? Why would we have to go to a smaller area as we drop? So Victor just put conserve velocity. It's not about conserving velocity. We already saw that a decrease in area means what with the velocity? Decrease or increase? It's an increase. Okay, so what we know is that there has to be greater velocity down at the bottom of this water tube than at the top. Why is there greater velocity down here? And it has nothing to do with the fact that this is water. So it has nothing to do with pressure. It's what, it's what Victor, it's what you always tell me always matters in every kind of anything we ever do. <laughs> yeah, there you go, Max. Gravity, right? What happens to an object when it falls? What happens to it? It gets accelerated, right? We go through gravitational acceleration, which means its speed increases. Greater velocity means we need smaller area. So even something as simple as the water coming out of your faucet shows that what we're talking about here with incompressible flows must be true. So anyway. Again, why I love physics, because anywhere you look, you see this stuff, if you pay attention for it, if you know what to look for. Okay, so um, I wanna talk about one more thing with fluids, and let's talk about these flows that are not laminar. Let's talk about ones that um, have some chaos to them that are turbulent, and what's causing that, um, and this is where things really get interesting, actually, is when you get these um, more turbulent flows and the non-laminar stuff happening. Okay, so um, let's start by defining viscosity. So viscosity is basically, um, a good way to think about it is the thickness of a fluid. Okay, how thick is it? We'll define it better. But um, viscosity, a large viscosity fluid is something that um, is really slow flowing. So things like honey, lava, um, oil, um, especially some oils are super high viscosity. All right, so um, it's basically a measure of the flow of the thickness. Okay, that's a, that's a good non-scientific way of thinking about viscosity. Now, what viscosity actually is, is the internal friction, right? So think about 
we've got these particles that are flowing against each other. Um, just take my hands as, you know, things are parts of the fluid. Okay. So if we have low viscosity, low viscosity means there's not much friction. So it's just going to slide past the others. Okay. If we have high viscosity, that's a great friction, then it's going to be very slow to go across, right? Like just take your hands and put them together. If you don't push very hard, they slide easily. If you apply force from the outside, now it's hard to make them go, right? And you just can't make it go as fast. It's the same idea, okay? So it's, it's internal friction. So when something is viscous, there's a lot of internal friction. So the way we define viscosity, because we give a number to it, um, and it's actually related to the bulk modulus and Young's modulus, all those moduli we saw before. Let me switch to the board. And now I'm going to try the whiteboard again. Let me share my screen. Only way I'm going to get good at this is if I practice it. Okay, so you should all see my whiteboard again. Um, I'm going to go ahead and clear that picture. <clears throat> okay, so viscosity. This is how we define it. Okay, so viscosity. Oh, looks like I'm writing like a four-year-old. Um, <laughs> we use the Greek letter eta, so it's kind of a curvy N. And the way we define this is it's shear, so it's shear stress divided by the strain rate. Oops. And this is where it's a little bit different. Before, remember that what it was was the strain, the shear strain. Now we're saying it's a strain rate. Okay, so how do we calculate that then? Well, shear stress, do you remember how that's formed? Okay, good, Victor. It was a force per area. So up here, we'll put force per area. Now, before, when we talked about the strain, we looked at just deformation, right? Well, now this is a rate. So this is the rate of change of the strain. So basically, it's going to be the speed of V Right, so it's the speed of the, the surface divided by L. So instead of before it was an H over L, let me, let me draw that picture again. So this was the picture for strain, right? And, and what we looked for is we are basically looking at a ratio of those two, right? X over L. Well, that's our L, but V is going to be the velocity that we've got going up here. So it's similar, but it's definitely different because now this is a strain rate instead of a shear strain. Okay, so then if we wanted to actually use this to calculate what kind of force we need, like if you solve this thing for F, you get eta times A times V over L. And the way to think about this, this force right here, this is the force that you would need to actually get the motion. Okay, so if you want to create motion, this force, it's proportional to the speed that you're going to take on, 
But notice it also depends on the viscosity. If something is really thick, doesn't flow very well, you have to apply more force to get it to flow. Right? That's why, like, if you were to take a glass of water and dump it, it flushes right out. But if you were to take a glass of honey and dump it, it takes a long time for that honey to work its way out. So that's what this is it. That's what that eta does. The greater the eta, the greater the viscosity. Okay, but now there's also something kind of interesting that happens. And this is definitely near and dear to my heart with what I studied. Um, let's look at a flow, a fluid flow that's happening near a surface. Okay, so since for me, this was always the bottom of the ocean. So we're gonna have brown here, this is the bottom of the ocean. So that's all the, the fun stuff, all the sediment and rocks and whatnot. Okay, so here's the bottom of the ocean. All right, so then we're gonna have water that's flowing by. Okay, so we're gonna take horizontal flow of water. So you'll notice that uh, I do have those arrows getting shorter and that is on purpose um, because think about it this way. The frictional force is gonna be greatest down here near the surface. The water is going to interact with the surface layer. It's going to get slowed down. So if we think of this maybe as a velocity vector, it's a little bit shorter. As we go up in the water column, we're further away from the ground. And so there's going to be less drag, less of an effect. So that's why that one's a little bit longer, a little bit longer still until eventually we don't even notice the ground anymore and we get arrows that are all roughly the same length. Okay, so this region right here, the region where we actually notice the change, so let's just say from there to there, we call this the boundary layer. Yeah. Hello, what was that? Stop drawing. Okay, I have no idea what just happened there. Pardon me. Okay, so like I said, we call this the boundary layer. And it is pretty interesting that we always see this, whether it's the bottom of the ocean, the side of a pipe, right, whatever, wherever we have a fluid flowing, um, we see this boundary layer. And um, it usually ends up being exponential as well. Like if you were to look at this, that part tends to be kind of exponential um, until it isn't noticed anymore and just goes. Okay, well, the reason I wanted to talk about this in terms of um, turbulent flow and all that is that down at this boundary layer, the other thing that ends up happening, a little pink. So think about this flow down here. It may start going nice and straight, but then it gets like, affected by the rock and stuff and so it'll spin and you end up getting really good turbulence down here because of the gravity. Now depending upon how thick your object is, depending upon the viscosity, really gives you a measure of how much turbulence you actually get. All right, so Basically, the way that you can look at this is you can create what's called a pressure gradient. So like if you were to look at, remember this 
line right here. The way that that follows, there's a formula for this. Um, I don't know that I really want to go into it all that much. Um, but it depends on your viscosity. The greater the viscosity, the greater this change, the greater this slope. So if it's not very viscous, then what you're going to see, instead of a line that does that, you're going to see a line that does that. So this would be low viscosity. This red one would be higher viscosity. If it's really viscous, what you would see is something like that. So viscosity plays a huge part in what we see with turbulent flow, which is one of the reasons why this is so much more complicated um, because you have to know the internal workings of the fluid, okay? So basically what I want you to get from viscosity is um, thick means very high viscosity, thin is low viscosity, low viscosity flows much better, high viscosity um, retards it more, it slows it down. Okay, so I'm going to stop sharing here. All right, so any questions about viscosity that kind of makes sense? So it's not necessarily related to like the polarity of certain molecules? Uh, no, it definitely can be related because when you think about what causes the friction between the molecules, um, that, I mean, obviously, if we look at it in a chem from a microscopic chemical standpoint, um, that is a big part of it because um, suppose you've got things that, are you thinking like water? tends to be a bit like a, a bit of a dipole. Yeah, because like you, you splash some water on a surface, it's going to stick to it. I mean, that's yeah. a good example. Yeah. So um, that definitely can happen. Um, and let me give you an example specifically from what I did. So I was looking at sediment transport. I was looking at how the sediment gets moved by the tides. And um, you got very different movement if it was sand versus clay. Um, so sand, it's not exactly round, but if you look really closely at sand, it's mostly round. Like um, next time you're at the beach or something, go down take, and really look at it and you'll see that it's um, mostly kind of roundish. Um, but if you look at clays, clays are very flat. So the, the individual grains, grains of clay are like leaves. And um, now this isn't exactly the same, but it kind of gets at that idea of the polarity. So imagine you have a whole bunch of leaves on top of each other. They can naturally form um, through the process of getting near each other um, areas of positive and then like negative. So you'll get one of these leaves or, or um, yeah, flakes, I guess, of clay that's very positive on top and then negative on the bottom. So you get to another one and that negative on the bottom sticks to the positive on the top. And so clays really stick together because of that same idea. So it requires a much greater force to pry them off. Now, if you have a fluid, it's kind of similar, right? So you take something like water that does, um, for those of you who don't know, water tends to have in the molecule a positive side and a negative side because of the orientation of um, the two hydrogens and the oxygen. Like a water molecule looks like Mickey Mouse, right? Where you got the head, that's the oxygen, and then you got the two hydrogens. And those two hydrogens are kind of up here um, because of the way that they share their electrons to form the bonds, it actually polarizes the molecule so that you get positive and negative on the two ends. 
Um, and that's kind of what Bradley was talking about. So then um, because of that, electromagnetic uh, force will cause it to stick to things. Um, water also has water tension, which is an, another story. But um, so if we have something, a fluid that has like a pretty drastic polarity, so things want to stick together, that's going to increase the internal friction. It's going to increase how much force you need to, you know, cause it to make it move. So it's going to have a higher viscosity. So the things that cause viscosity really are the interactions between the molecules. You know, so um, when you, I think actually you're saying, so it has nothing to do with, it's like, no, nah, it kind of has everything to do with. And if I'm misquoting you, I apologize, but um, it, it's all about the internal structure of the material itself. So I, I don't know enough chemistry to say why like, honey is really, really thick. Why, you know, um, blood is thin. You know, I, I don't know what causes the actual viscosities um, other than I know that it is the interactions between the molecules that make it up. So. Makes sense. Good yeah. enough answer? Oh, yeah. Okay. If not, I'll keep bullshitting for a little bit more and then finally you'll say, okay, sounds good. Oh, yeah, by the way, that's a secret. Don't tell anybody that that's what I do. I don't know anything. I just talk and talk and talk until people go, okay. And that was a joke, by the way. I know a little bit about some stuff. All right, so we feeling good about viscosity-ish? Okay, um, so that's really fluids. Um, like I told you before we started, it was going to be the real brief top level. Here are the things that are going on um, because you literally can take, well, in my case, years of classes on fluid dynamics. Um, so there, there's a lot to it, but um, these are the basics. So remember what the big things are. We now have um, so we got pressure, fluids exert pressure. That's what causes like my little styrofoam cup to get crunched down, right? I mean, so think about that. We didn't talk about that since I showed it to you at first time. But remember we calculated um, pressures that were the good old rho GH. So think about what kind of force that was being applied. Um, salt water, its density is already a little bit more than fresh water. So it's like 1,030 kilograms per cubic meter. Gravity is gravity, um, but the H, the height of the water column, um, we sent that down like 3,000 meters. Okay, so it's like three kilometers underwater. So just imagine what kind of number we're talking, right? I mean, it's an incredible number of atmospheres, um, which is why it got crushed. I mean, your body would get crushed too. Um, when we send submarines down that depth, we have to design them really, really carefully because of the intense and immense pressure. Anyway, so we've got pressure, but then, um, and that pressure goes through the entire fluid, right? But then we've got buoyant forces now, Archimedes principle, right? That there's going to be a force pushing up that's equivalent to the mass of the fluid that's displaced. Um, when we start having flows, we saw we've got the continuity so that the A times V is constant. So if we're going to change the area, cross-sectional area of a flow, we have to increase the velocity. Um, and then we got to Bernoulli, and Bernoulli really ties it all together. Um, so those are the big things for the laminar flow. And then turbulent flow, um, you need crazy differential equations. You need math that's well beyond where you guys are um, to do that, which is why, well, that'll come later if you go that direction. Um, I don't know if anybody's thinking about going into any kind of oceanography or atmospheric science or 
aerospace engineering or anything like that. Um, if you do any of that kind of thing, you'll see plenty of fluids later, I promise. Okay, so there's fluids. Um, I'm feeling pretty good about where we are, so I am going to pause here, but don't run away just yet. 